Welcome to a special edition of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. I'm your host, DL, and in this episode, I'm going to respond to a video that recently came out from MSNBC with Chris Hayes and Ilya Salmon from the Cato Institute. It's titled, Even Libertarians Aren't Buying the Freedom to Be Unvaccinated Argument. Let's go ahead and walk through this video and see what we can uncover. We don't have to accept the mandates, lockdowns, and harmful policies of the petty tyrants and bureaucrats. They do not respect your liberty. They do not respect your right to make your choices about your health care, about your children, about your lives. I see no reason to be pushing vaccines on people. But it's just like their philosophy. They want to mandate. They want to impose. Individual safety is managed every day as a matter of personal responsibility rather than by government mandate. There's been talk about potentially people advocating at the federal level imposing compulsory mask on kids. Uh, we, we're not doing that in Florida, okay? First thing to note, not one of these people are libertarians. Now, I'm not the type to go around telling people that they are or are not libertarian. I think it's poor form. But to my knowledge, none of them outwardly claim to be a libertarian, and none of them are members of the Libertarian Party. That's rather important. Senator Rand Paul comes the closest of them all, but as many members of the Libertarian Party have noted over many years, he has said things and voted in ways that make bearing the label a very heavy lift. But let's continue watching. Republican politicians like to pretend they're sticking to libertarian values, citing liberty, freedom, personal choice, as reasons to oppose just about every measure that could stem the spread of COVID. But the thing is, a lot of actual libertarian legal scholars say vaccine mandates, for example, are actually okay. They're fine because you can have personal freedom for yourself, but not at the expense of others. Ilya Soman is a professor of law at George Mason University and an adjunct scholar at the Libertarian Cato Institute. He joins me now. Okay, so he's sort of correct here. Republicans are definitely not libertarians. Libertarians have their own party. It's called the Libertarian Party and is the third largest party in the United States. Republicans do have a tendency to try and play a libertarian card, but I'd actually argue it's more of a liberty and freedom card because libertarians have a vastly different idea about what those two concepts mean than do Republicans. Hayes uses some clever language here. He's setting the stage for authority when he says, actual libertarian scholars. And he includes the ever so lovely weasel phrase, a lot of. Look, Chris, what does that even mean? A lot of what, the ones that you've spoken to? A lot of those from the total? Look, when you hear words and phrases like many, a lot of, some, it's more than likely coded language for, I found that one person who said what I was looking for and then didn't bother looking any further. If you've traveled in libertarian circles, you'll know that there's a divide on whether or not those from the Cato Institute accurately represent libertarians or libertarian ideas. But again, I'm not here to credential who is and is not a libertarian, though I might credential myself. So with that, what I have here is the official Libertarian Party card, and that seems pretty legit. And then also during the last election, I served as a delegate from Florida at the National Convention. I've also spent some time at the state level on the Rules Committee and Candidates Committee. And locally, I've helped revive the Libertarian Party here in Jacksonville, Florida, when it fell apart several years ago, and then went on to serve as their secretary, their treasurer, and I am now the chair. Oh, almost forgot, one more thing. All right, now that I'm properly credentialed, I think I'm ready to hang with the big dogs. So let's hear a little bit more. Um, Professor Soman, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Explain to our viewers why vaccine mandates, in your view, are not oppression, not authoritarianism, not tyranny, as some self-styled libertarians have claimed in recent days. So thank you very much for having me. I think they are a restriction on freedom, but they're a very small one uh, with a very large payoff, not just for the person who gets vaccinated, 
but for other people they come into contact with as well. And that makes them very different from other infringements on liberty that are either much larger, as in the case of lockdowns, for example, or uh, where there's little or no benefit except possibly a benefit to the individual himself. So I think vaccines, therefore, are a special case where you get a small infringement on freedom, you get the jab, but then you can move on with your life at worst in a day or two. Uh, and on the other hand, there's a big payoff in terms of saving lives, uh, whereas there are other kinds of restrictions on liberty which are much more severe and are very different. There's no such thing as a self-styled libertarian. I mean, have you ever heard of a self-styled Republican or self-styled Democrat, maybe a self-styled socialist or communist? It's simply a made up term that only serves to say this guy's legit and everyone else is just an unorthodox cultist claiming the label. Don't listen to them. The absolute foundation of libertarianism is simply self-ownership. It's the idea that you own yourself and all the other arguments sprout from that. Salmon starts with this different foundation. It's this perceived level of intrusion upon a person and the benefit to that person and then those around them that determines if a vaccine mandate is or is not authoritarianism, tyranny, or oppression. This is a problem for two big reasons. Number one, Salmon is determining the level of intrusion upon a person, but that isn't his decision to make. It's not his body. Self-ownership means I own me and therefore I decide. And number two, with the foundation of libertarianism being self-ownership, then benefit to others, well, th that's out the window. What benefits me may not benefit you. Many try to make the argument that your freedom ends where another's nose begins, and there is truth to that. But whether or not the unvaccinated person violates the rights of another isn't the argument being made. More importantly, there is a distinct difference between what benefits another person and what harms another person. So you've done all the reading. You're a scholar, you're a professor. You've done all the reading. You've done the intellectual heavy lifting. But I do wonder for others in other cases whether libertarianism today is just an excuse for many on the right to act selfishly, recklessly, and then pretend it's all about freedom and liberty when, of course, your freedom ends where mine begins. People of almost every ideology cite liberty uh, when they think it's convenient to do so. The Republicans you mentioned earlier, none of them are actually libertarians. None of them, not even Rand Paul, actually described themselves as libertarians. So uh, like many politicians, they will resort to pro-liberty arguments when they think it's politically convenient. Uh, but I don't think either they or other politicians on either right or left necessarily exemplify libertarianism in any way. Again, Chris props up Salmon, pointing out he's done all the reading, he's a scholar, he's done all the heavy lifting. I'm going to save my comment on that for the end. Chris then makes the argument that your liberty ends where my freedom begins. I mentioned that a moment ago. But remember, there is a difference between what benefits a person and what harms a person. Here Salmon is correct. People love to cite liberty when it's politically convenient. I don't have a lot to quibble with here. So let's go ahead and keep on listening. It's funny you mentioned Rand Paul. I, I believe he was named by his father, Congressman Ron Paul, after Ayn Rand, the uh, hero to many libertarians. He does, you know, do the shtick about freedom and liberty. But as you point out, libertarianism, for example, uh, is, a, is, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, is in favor of open borders or fewer restrictions on the freedom of movement. And yet you have people like Ron DeSantis uh, blaming immigrants for the spread of COVID, supporting the building of a wall. How does that fit with libertarianism? Very poorly. Uh, libertarianism certainly opposes severe restrictions on liberty, and there are a few more severe than migration restrictions, which can find people to lives of poverty and oppression simply because they happen to be born in the wrong place or to the wrong parents. And it's certainly a far more severe restriction than a vaccine mandate. I don't know whether Rand Paul was named after Ayn Rand or not, but he himself describes himself not as libertarian, but as a quote unquote constitutional conservative. Uh, so uh, he is not a consistent libertarian and to his credit doesn't claim to be. Here we see that Chris just hasn't done his homework. 
He goes on about Rand and Ron Paul, then jumps to open borders, and then shifts to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and a wall. None of that has anything to do with this. Salmon already said that none of those people at the beginning of this clip were self-identified libertarians. Chris's continued use of them is malfeasance, not journalism. Salmon's response isn't much better, though. He continues this idea that libertarianism opposes severe restrictions. But that isn't really true. Libertarianism isn't defined by the degree of restriction. It starts with the principle of self-ownership, and everything else either submits or is in violation. I do want to briefly address the two other items that were mentioned, Borders and Ayn Rand. <laughs> Many libertarians have certainly read Ayn Rand, but you know who talks about her? Non-libertarians. The conversations I have observed, they mention any number of other names, such as Mises, Bastiat, Hayek, Rothbard, just to name a few. Whenever someone tells you about how Ayn Rand is a hero to many libertarians, there is a good chance they don't know what they are talking about. It's not that we dismiss her altogether so much as her name is just below a number of others in terms of heroes and great thinkers. Now, borders. I was disappointed that Salmon doesn't make clear the division about borders within the libertarian community. It's true that we prefer open borders, but many prioritize that with other social issues. When you observe the community, I think what you'll find are three primary positions. There's the open borders, which tends to be a more permanent solution, exactly what it sounds like. Then there's the closed borders. It's a bit deceiving as many libertarians will insist that some level of limitation is necessary in the short term until our welfare system is reined in. If I understand the open border, closed border debate between the libertarians correctly, that is the crux of the issue. Those who are open borders insist that it's wrong to curtail freedom of movement while waiting for some other issue to be resolved, while those who are closed borders insist that it needs dealt with first. And then lastly, there's the position that I take. It's a more Ellis Island position. It's effectively a pretty open border position that restricts those with violent criminal backgrounds from coming in, as well as those who have communicable diseases, such as Ebola. Libertarianism is definitely about open borders, but that debate tends to be primarily when that starts, and any reference to DeSantis or Walls has little to nothing to do with us in the libertarian community. With that said, let's move on and hear some more. So uh, what is your position on mask mandates? Because we talked about vaccine mandates. You said, uh, you know, the infringement is minor and the payoff is big. The other big row, and we played uh, a clip earlier in Tennessee, people losing their minds screaming about masks. Some people seem to have lost their minds on the right about the idea of putting a mask on their face for a few hours a day to protect their fellow citizens. Uh, a lot of Republican governors gone out of the way to ban mask mandates. Where do you stand on that? What is the libertarian position on mask mandates in your view? I don't know that there's one single consistent libertarian position on this, but my own view is that mask mandates are very different from vaccine mandates because they're a much more severe imposition on liberty in that it's not just a jab and then you go on with your life. It's potentially any time you go inside in an indoor public space, you get this pretty severe restriction, which is very painful and annoying for many people, particularly those who wear glasses or have sensitive face or have other conditions. It also significantly inhibits normal human communication, uh, which both studies and common sense show often comes through facial expressions. Moreover, to put it mildly, the evidence that mask mandates actually throw the spread of COVID is much, much weaker than in the case of uh, but in the case of vaccines, there's much more division among experts over that. So what we have there is a much more severe imposition on liberty for a much smaller payoff than with vaccines. So my view is that uh, if you have the option of vaccination, which we do, and if necessary, in some cases, you can use vaccine mandates, then that's the option we should pursue rather than more severe impositions on liberty, including mass mandates, lockdowns, migration restrictions, and so on. Salmon describes mask mandates as a more severe imposition on liberty, while vac vaccine mandates are not. Or as he said, it's not just a jab and then you are on with your life. He compares against mask mandates, which impact people with a more regularity and are obtrusive to people who say wear glasses, like me, along with impeding human communication. 
In other words, Simon equates tyranny and authoritarianism to the degree of inconvenience that he recognizes. To use a really crude analogy, it's the political equivalent of just the tip. He then goes on to further make his case by pointing out there are higher levels of division from experts on the efficacy of mask mandates and lockdowns while there's more agreement on the efficacy of vaccines. Let's be clear what he's really saying here. Your liberty is dependent on consensus of experts and the frequency that you personally experience a particular policy. A shot, it's quick and easy and leaves you with maybe a day or two of not feeling so well, and then you go on about your way, while mask and lockdowns, well, they interrupt your daily life. That isn't liberty. But how does that fit with the Libertarian Party? The first sentence of the National Party platform says this, quote, as libertarians, we seek a world of liberty, a world in which all individuals are sovereign over their own lives and are not forced to sacrifice their values for the benefit of others. So already, Professor Salmon is at odds with the National Party platform just one sentence in. We move on to the second sentence, and this is what it says. We believe that respect for individual rights is essential precondition for a free and prosperous world, that force and fraud must be banished from human relationships, and that only through freedom can peace and prosperity be realized. And then we move on to the next two sentences, which say this. Consequently, we defend each person's right to engage in any activity that is peaceful and honest, and welcome the diversity that freedom brings the world we seek to build is one where individuals are free to allow their own dreams, to follow their own dreams in their own ways without interference from government or any authoritarian power. Are you getting the theme here? In the first four sentences of the National Party platform, the National Libertarian Party plat platform, the individual is referenced four times. Throughout the entire platform, the word individual is used 40 times. That is not on accident. Nowhere in, the part plat nowhere in the party platform does it state or suggest that the individual rights are subject to the degree of inconvenience or the level of agreement by experts. Now, maybe that's not convincing enough. How about this? On April 21st, 2021, the National Party put out a press release on vaccine passports saying, we oppose vaccine passports and any government mandated documentation, surveillance, restrictions, mandates, or laws which tread on the rights of the people. We stand in service of those seeking freedom in the United States as the centrifugal force of liberty. And then, since I'm out of Florida, on August 3rd, the Libertarian Party of Florida, of which, again, I'm a member, of, put out a similar press release saying, the Libertarian Party of Florida believes all people have the right to choose how to protect themselves from peril, be it medical or violent. We believe business owners have the right to determine who may be on their premises. So think about that. It stands to reason the national and the state level oppose vaccine passports on the ground that they tread on the rights of the people, the individuals, that they would also oppose any government mandated vaccine policy. It's the only consistent position. Now, I want to circle back to this idea that Salmon is the intellectual who has done the reading, the heavy lifting, and should be considered an authority. It's really the authority apart that I want to question. And I will end this with a very simple question for you to think about. If he is such an authority on libertarianism, then why isn't anything in his view reflected in the National Party platform or the state party? And why is it not reflected in either of the press releases that I just read you or the many other state parties?